Welcome to another episode of Comedy Wham Presents with me, your host, Valerie, coming to you from Moon Tower 2018. ComedyWham.com is your place to go for features about all Austin comedy and those passing through Austin. We bring you articles and podcasts featuring the best in Austin comedy in all its shapes and formats. Started in 2016, the podcast project brings you funny people and their stories. As a fan, I like to delve into a comic's background and motivations, and we usually take a detour along the way. Consider the interview a way for you to get to know the folks that make the Austin comedy scene one of the best in the country. Today I sit down with someone that I've been pinching myself about since I got word the stars would align to interview him. I'm sure it's something he's used to. They say that he's an iconic member of Kids in the Hall, and they're right, who's always had a flamboyant flair for comedy. They say that he's been on so many shows, from Reno 911 to Hannibal to The Larry Sanders Show to Star Trek Voyager, and countless more TV and movie credits. They say that he's back on stage bringing back lounge lizard Buddy Cole with his current stage show in Après le Déluge, the Buddy Cole monologues, which chronicles what Buddy has been up to since Kids in the Hall has been off the air in 1995. They say that timing is everything, and I'm so thrilled that my guest schedule allowed him to sit down with me. And now Comedy Wham presents, i got to take a deep breath here as I say this, our guest, Scott Thompson. Hello there. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. How Good. are you? You can stop pinching yourself. No, you can pinch me now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it was really funny. I was waiting for you downstairs, and... Um, because most people who are new to town, they don't know that you, you have to come oh, up yeah. through that one entrance to get uh, to, to this spot here in the Driscoll. Right. And my phone rings, and I'm thinking, well, I know how uh, Bruce and and Jess are really great, and Bruce is, is your manager, uh, and Jess or Bruce is your agent, Jess is manager, publicist, and so I. No, didn't... Bruce is my manager. Okay. Bruce and Zach, Jess is okay. my publicist. Ah, okay. All right. Yeah, I'm. You know, as a fan, I don't get all of the little nuances. I'm learning, I'm learning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, the phone rings, and I'm thinking, you know, Scott seems to me like somebody who would be very punctual. I am, actually. <laughs> yes, I am. So the phone rings at 101, and <laughs> it's so surreal. This is Scott Thompson. I'm here. <laughs> How many people in the world get to say they got a phone call from Scott Thompson? Ah. Uh, so no, I'm sorry. I'm going. Here's our controversy. I am going to continue pinching myself. Okay, so, that's fine. Yeah, as long as we can set those. A lot of people know it's not me. <laughs> right. Yes. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I like to formally break the ice by asking sure. my guests one word to describe their past. Turbulent. Turbulent. Okay. I think that's a good one. Mm-hmm. Care to elaborate? Well, I've, I, I've uh, you know, I'm in the middle of a rocky life. Uh, I'm, I've had a very, I'm, I'm, I'm having a very, I've had, I'm having a good life. Uh -huh. But I've had, I've had a lot of ups and downs. Yeah. That's yeah. all. Um, yeah. I think that's probably what I wanted when I was a child. I, I, I did want an adventurous life. Yeah. And I wanted to put myself into the center of things. I really, I grew up in a small town in Canada, and a large family very hard to make yourself known and uh, I, I really made it when I was a kid I, I really wanted to live a very exciting life that yeah. was my goal mm. more than almost even my um, it was a number almost my number one ambition was to have an exciting life yeah um, yes I had lots of things that I wanted to accomplish but I never really thought about being a comedian or any of those things I just thought I need to I, I want to have that kind of a life where um, I'm I, I don't want to be a bystander. I want to be. Um, I want to be at one of the main players. Yeah. Of of my yeah. Of course, you're the main player of your own life, but yeah, I just wanted excitement and adventure, and I, I have gotten it in spades. Yeah. Yeah. How did the small town Scott end up on one of the most? I think this is one of the iconic sketch groups. In well, you know, I, I after after high school, I am. Um, I took a year off. I lived in the Philippines, and then I went back. When I got back, I took a, I, um, I went to university okay. to study um, theater, okay. which I kept as a secret. I, I didn't tell my brother. I had four brothers, and a large, fa so it was a very uh, masculine family. Mm -hmm. And in my day, um, for a boy to be an actor was basically 
um, saying you were gay. Yeah. Sure. Really. And so I never told anybody any of my real dreams. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really, when I was very young, I wanted to be a ballet dancer. That's what my goal was. But I couldn't even bear to tell anybody because I knew that it would out me. Mm -hmm. So I kept all of that inside. And then once I finished high school, and I had my year in this program called Canada World Youth, which allowed me to be myself, I still didn't come out. But um, I decided I would go to into acting. And my parents were completely flummoxed by it because hmm. I'd never really expressed much because every time I I wouldn't dare to because I grew up in a hockey playing family of boys in the 70s so you didn't do that sort of thing and um, they didn't understand at all they thought I was going to be a ju I'd always lied to them I told them I was going to be a journalist and I'd tell my mother I'd be a doctor all the things they wanted to yeah. hear but then after that year away I went I, 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 this is what I want to be but I had no intentions of being a comedian hmm. and then I went to university I studied theater and you know, I had a rocky road in theater. Uh, I didn't know anything. I didn't know. I never. I didn't know anything about the world. I was never really encouraged. Even to. though you went to the Philippines, I mean, that's a worldly experience. Yes. Oh, I'm. Yeah. I mean, I'm. I was definitely well on my way to becoming a worldly person, but I certainly knew nothing about um, the arts. Oh. I was not from an artistic family. It was never encouraged. Yeah. Um, it was actually always that was something you had. It was like a dark secret. And, um, but then I thought when I finally, that year in this program allowed me to get the courage to be who I wanted. Well, to start, because saying I wanted to be an actor was in many ways my first step towards saying I was gay as well. And, uh, but I had a very rocky time in, in school. You know, I was quite good in academics, but I didn't know anything in, I didn't know anything about acting or any of that stuff. I didn't know plays, I didn't know what they were talking about. I just had a lot of energy, and I, I acted out a lot. So I got in a lot of trouble, a lot of trouble, and, just, and they kicked me out of school in my uh, my fourth, my final year. Oh, they threw wow. me out of the program for being um, disruptive. That was mm -hmm. the word. And um, so I finished my degree in English, which I always thought was good. Like I mean, there's no, you can't really, there's no, you can't learn too much. And um, and then when I finished, I. Um, I decided I would be, a, I don't want to be an actor, like a regular actor. I, I didn't want, comedy didn't seem possible. I didn't grow up, it's not like I, I didn't grow up loving stand-up comics or anything, you okay. know. Um, yeah, that's one of my questions no. often is, do you no, have no, early no, comedic No, 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 there was nothing yeah. that I, there were certain comedians I really loved, yeah. you know, um, but most, it was mostly sketch comedy, like Carol Burnett or that mm. sort of thing. Uh, that was my, she was my idol, but I never dreamed it was possible. And for stand-up comedy, particularly, I, I didn't think that was possible for a person like me. You couldn't. It, to me, stand-up comedy, that the kind that I really love, is stuff that's very personal and talks about a person's life. And there was no way I could talk about my life because it was too... You just couldn't. I didn't even come out in university. I mean, hmm. I was in a four-year acting program. I still didn't come out. That's how deeply closeted I was and how different the times were. Right. I mean, they, they were right. just a very, very different time. It's very striking to me that you say that you really wanted to pursue acting, but I'm yes. sure I'm not the first to say you were acting your entire life because you were Well, absolutely. This. And that is why I think, you know, why gay men particularly are dominant in acting, even mm. though most of them are in the closet. We are everywhere. Yeah. And that's, especially our generation, the, uh, my generation, and, you know, younger ones are going to be different. Yeah. Because they, yeah. They're not, they don't have to act their whole life the way we did yeah like you have to play a role mm -hmm. and I grew up in a masculine family and I played a role mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I didn't do it that well <laughs> but I certainly know how to pass mm -hmm. and um, but stand-up comedy no that's what I probably if I was born today like if I was a kid today yeah. that's most likely where I would have gone but not then and, and, and it was and then when I graduated I had a very um, piss poor um, acting career like mm. not I didn't do I wasn't doing well at all I didn't know what to do and I think I, I, I had a lot of control issues um, surprising of, I, like I acted out a lot let's uh -huh. just put it that way um, I didn't know I just didn't know how to control myself and um, and then uh, one day I, I uh, my friend Darlene Harrison she said there was a a group called the Kids in the Hall mm -hmm. that were performing uh, midnight shows at the Poor Alex Theatre in Toronto 
and I just started doing improvisation, and we just formed a team, me and uh, Darlene and Karen Ballard and Tim Sims. We were called the Love Cats, and I discovered improv. And I, I, I wasn't very good at it, and I didn't really, I mean, I was always terrified by it, but I had a, I think, it, it did allow me in, in many ways just a, a, an, a, an outlet for my, uh, my energy. My, my violence in a way I mean I felt very violent towards the world I was very angry and um, and then she took me to this show and uh, it was uh, love at first sight well, yeah, I was, like, yeah, there's I was no thinking, yeah. I, I saw it, they were performing there were eight of them at the time there was even a woman in the group called Sanders Jamis and um, I, I didn't know what I was even seeing I was like this is exactly what I need to do mm. and, I, and I remember whispering to Darlene I'm gonna be in the group and she said you don't even know them <laughs> but I'm like well I just said well I know but it's going to happen I had I had a revelation uh. that it was meant to be that I would I would befriend them that they would eventually uh -huh. ask me to join because I just knew they need <laughs> it was maybe arrogant <laughs> but I really believed they needed me mm -hmm. I needed them and, um, and it was very, fam and and um, and that was it. And then what I did was, this is, this, you know, they had these donuts taped under the seats in this little theater. It's a very, there was almost no one there. And I discovered these donuts, and I was like, and I went, oh, there's donuts under all the seats. And I assumed that they were doing some sort of a bit later on, and they'd need those donuts. And I don't know what I was thinking, but I thought, well, maybe if I throw the donuts at them, they'll notice me. Uh huh. And that's what I did. So I kind of ruined their show. <laughs> I didn't really think it through. And I remember Bruce McCullough coming up to me afterwards like, are you the asshole who threw the donuts? I'm like, what a yeah. great start. And I'm like, we all, and I, are you the asshole on stage? <laughs> and um, I think he was like, what the fuck? And Bruce is a bit of an asshole like me. And he, I think he, there was a kind of, I think, a grudging respect for uh -huh. me. Like, and I was like a real punk at the time. I was in a punk band. We were called Mouth Congress with Paul Bellini, who I ended up writing with. And I just was, I really had no, at the time, I, I had no real um, respect for institutions of any kind. Mm. I was very a very angry kid. Yeah. I wanted to bring it all down. That's really who I was. So it was a therapeutic experience for you yes. to be part of that group? And I just knew that was where I was supposed to go. And that's it. And then... What happened was Mark saw me perform at theater sports, and um, he saw me do a, an, um, a performance, which is quite, I mean, I wouldn't even call it good. It wasn't funny. I just, but I remember someone took, a, I think Tim took a dump, a, a, make, a, fa a fake dump, okay. and I remember pulling the shit out, <laughs> pretending and holding it to the, <laughs> to the air like New York skull and, and making a monologue about it. And I think Mark was like, and I was wearing a yellow pantsuit, and, and I had my hair teased up, and I wore pearls. I had like three strands of pearls, like Barbara Bush. Uh -huh. And um, I um, think Mark was like, this guy's a freak. <laughs> and then they asked me to do a set with them, and I, and I arrived with a bag of wigs, and uh, I had some wigs I'd found, and some costumes, and I just, I arrived. Like I moved in, like the, uh -huh. it was like a first date. I, I moved right in. Like I arrived with my clothes and uh -huh. all my possessions, and I was like, "You have no choice. Yeah. I'm not leaving." Yeah. And that, that was my attitude. And oh, um, I just um, the first thing I wrote for the show, not for that first appearance, was probably my Fran monologue, where Fran's son comes out, Brian, mm. played by Dave. I played Fran, my mother, and. Um, I think after they saw, and that was before Buddy even. I mean, my first three pieces were Fran, then, and I ne never really talked Manny Kuhn, my art professor, and then Buddy. Mm. But um, it was not Buddy, it was not first. It was Fran, Manny, Buddy. Uh -huh. And um, after that first Fran monologue, I think the five of them, because by, when I started performing, a m number of the guys in the group j uh, dropped out. Mm. I'm not saying it was because of me, yeah. but they had other, and they've all done very well. Sandra became um, a very famous Canadian uh, comedian. Mm. The other writers are all huge writers who are behind so many amazing shows. So they all did very well. Yeah. But I, I had to perform. And... Um, and that was it. And then I 
guess after about six months of performing with them, they accepted me. And they made a little song up, and they brought me into the group, and that was it. And I knew, we didn't do a, like a blood ceremony, but it was close, <laughs> close. And I mean, okay, we mingled fluids, but maybe not blood. <laughs> And I and, that, and I was very and I and that was five of us and I was very comfortable in five men as a team. And um, I mean I grew up in a five brothers. Yeah, yeah, you're I grew used up, to that. It's a hockey lineup. You know, I was always left wing. I knew what my position was, um, and um, I liked being on a team. But I had a lot to learn because I I was very much a like a show pony, mm -hmm. and um, I didn't know how to listen. I didn't know how to write. I didn't know how to. Um, I didn't know how to subvert myself into the group, which is a very important thing in a, in any kind of a group. Yeah, any but, collaboration. You know, any is, collaboration. Yeah. And I was very much a shiner, as they called me. Mm. And I didn't know. I really did not know how to. And they they taught me, you know, through many reasons. Compared to your experience when you joined, right? How much experience had they had? working together well I was I'm older than all of them like I'm the oldest member of the group I came to everything late in life mm -hmm. um, and they were all they all came from different backgrounds Kevin and Dave came from um, you know, they did they don't they gone to high school and mm -hmm. they still they gone right into common yeah. they knew exactly what they wanted from day one yeah and they they had their sights they knew exactly who they were I mean I think Dave and Kevin met they were 17 18 mm -hmm. There was the th and Mike Myers was around that they, the, those guys. Yeah. They knew exactly what they wanted, yeah. and they knew that they they weren't troubled by who they were. They they, they didn't they didn't have the same kind of existential crisis that I had, yeah. which is that I doubted my even why would I even I mean I doubted my my virtue as a human being mm -hmm. as a homosexual. I just always thought that I was garbage. So that's a very difficult thing to overcome. Yeah, yeah. And, and that changes you. I mean, I'm very great, and today it's a very different world. But back then, that's really what you had to overcome. Yeah. So I had a lot of issues to work through. Yeah. And my anger, you know. Let's see, even I can feel it. Yeah, yeah. And I'm yeah, not yeah. really ang I'm not really angry. I mean, I still, of course, there's always yeah. anger in comedy. Well, yeah, bringing you back to that time, you, I mean, I'm sure. I was a furious still, child. Yeah, still. Furious. Yeah. And um, so, you know. I learned, and that was it. I knew that I was never go leaving. Mm -hmm. And it's 30 years later, and I'm, you can't, yeah, we're, none of us are. Yeah. It's the mafia. We're in for <laughs> life. There's no question. And I'm very you comfortable have a with it. following, too. Yeah, I mean, and I'm very comfortable with it. Like, I, I love them as yeah. brothers, like my own brothers, and love my own brothers. And um, I know my place. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it was transformative not only for your career, but just for you oh, as, as a, a human as being. A human. Yeah. Yes. And I always, you know, for me, it's, you know, I've come to this conclusion. It's when you're performing and writing, it's an act of love for people. And it's a way to transfer, to tra transmute in many ways your pain and your anger and yeah. all these things into some, an act of love that you give the audience, mm -hmm. which is a stand in for humanity. Yeah. And so it just felt right for me. Yeah. And, um, I also discovered that I could play characters. I really had no idea that I could even do that. I wasn't one of those kids. I mean, I was a funny kid. I was definitely a class clown. But I wasn't one of those kids who did voices or imitated people. I couldn't do any of that stuff. Yeah. I was always distinctly myself. But because of my, the generation I came from, I had, to be, I had to split myself into characters. Now I'd probably be different. But then yeah. I had to become these people because I could not be myself. It wasn't possible. Mm -hmm. And I discovered that I had a talent for it. I mean, not a talent like Mark's. Like, I consider Mark's talent for, like, impersonation or characterization is, like, a gift from the gods. I don't have that. <laughs> um, like, I'm in awe of... I'm in awe of each one of them yeah. in, for different they each reasons. Bring something very each unique. one of them I'm yeah. in awe of. I mean, this, I, I still am. Yeah. And... Uh, I would look at Mark and go, how does he do that? I can't, like I couldn't, I can't just be told to play an Australian yeah. person who was raised black in Jamaica, but Mark can. <laughs> if they say, well, this is the Danish woman, uh -huh. but she spent the first 10 years of her life in Iraq. What do you think she sounds like? And Mark <laughs> would know, that's not me. I have to live yeah. and sleep with and be with these people uh -huh. for a long time before I can even begin to uh -huh. create a character. Yeah. 
Yeah. And they're all kind of slices of me. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, that, that, that's my story. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's part of your story. That's well, yeah, it's part, part of, of it. Your story. Yeah. Uh, we, um, we could probably spend hours and hours talking about the show itself, yeah, but we're basically. not going to do that. No, no, we're not. Because there's so much that has happened since the show, and people yes. can find, you know, they can watch the show, and they can uh, do their own research mm -hmm. on, on things. When the show uh, went off the air, I, I won't say that it ended, because it's... It's never it's, ended, yeah, but yes, yeah. when the first iteration ended, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you you went on tour together, mm -hmm. uh, which is when I, I got to see you perform live, which was a, a great great experience for me personally. And then um, you started all following your own career mm -hmm. paths, and you moved more into acting, or what? Well, what's it's what I. I mean, I, 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 that's I, that's I got you. Wanted. You know, basically, what happened was I, I was I had a very I had an amazing ten years. Finished the kids in the hall. We made brain candy. It was a disaster. I mean, not creatively, but financially, a <laughs> okay, disaster. Because right. <laughs> I love that show too. Yeah, I mean, I'm extremely proud of it. But it was a disaster. Um, and then we kind of split apart. We kind of broke up mm. for five years. We didn't really speak to each other, and um, we just drifted in our own worlds. And I think we were very much like brothers who had to establish ourselves, yeah. our own beachheads, right, you know what I mean? Right, right, absolutely. And, um, and I get that. I'm, I'm extremely comfortable with that mm -hmm. notion. I get it. Yeah. And then... This, this is actually why, I'll, you know, lots of major classic bands, you know, they disband, but then they decide, oh, we're going to do the reunion tour, because they realize, you know what, we are connected in a well, very deep thing, way. You this is what I would tell anyone young today, is that you think that you have, that chemistry comes constantly. No, it's very, very rare. Yeah. And that kind of thing happens maybe once or twice in your lifetime. And you need to, re you need to recognize it. Mm -hmm. And you need to understand that it, it might not happen ever again. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with... Like, I was very lucky to discover that when I was relatively young. And after those five years apart, you know, I got... Basically, I was in Turkey traveling, as I love to travel. Mm -hmm. And I got a call from my agent, my manager at the time, that uh, Gary Shandling was looking for me. And... Um, he wanted me to come up. He, he literally, he'd see me, I think, on Conan O'Brien, and he, because I became a real regular on Conan, uh -huh. and um, um, and I think Gary had been a big fan of the kids in the hall, and he wanted, he needed a new character because Linda Doucette had left, and they needed a character to play um, Jeffrey Tambor's assistant, and Gary just decided that it would be me. And, and, and I, I didn't, there was no audition, there was nothing. Nice. He flew me to L.A. and I met him and I think Judd Apatow. Mm. And I think it was Judd, there might have been someone else, Paul Sims, I can't remember, but I, I remember that. And Gary just told me that he wanted me to be on the show. And I, uh, I, and I was obsessed with Larry Sanders. And I didn't know what he, and he, but he just had one proviso and that was that I would play a gay character. Mm. And at the time, I'll be perfectly honest, I was a little resentful mm. because I really thought, oh, I want to play a character. I don't want to um, just be seen as, I was very, trying very hard to break out of that box. Yeah. I wanted to be an actor who could play anyone. I, would, I wanted to play a womanizer. I wanted to play, this is what I've been dying to play my whole life is a womanizer. Mm. And, um, you know, and I thought, but Gary Shanley's a genius. And that shows genius. And I thought, well, I will do anything for this man. Sure. So I made a deal with him. I said, I will play, I will, make, I will be Brian. That's the character we decided his name would be Brian. I will play him, but I will not play him as a snap queen. I'm not going to be all sassy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be a character who's very devoted to his job and devoted to Hank. And my key thing was, I said two things. I want the character to be Canadian, <laughs> openly Canadian, because that had never <laughs> happened before. Canadians always hid their identity. I wanted to be Canadian and I wanted him to um, think that um, Jeffrey Tambor Hank was a good man because mm. no one else did. Mm -hmm. I wanted, I said somebody on the show needs to be devoted to Hank. So that's, and Gary was like, mm, yeah, okay, that sounds good. <laughs> and that was it. And that was it. And so the character w came from that. Uh -huh. And I did three years on that show. And, um, and uh, but I was very naive. You know, like, I, I, um, it's hard for me to say this, but I'm going to. Like, extremely grateful to Gary Shandling and um, 
very proud of my work on this show, but there was a part of me that was resentful. Mm. I'll be very honest, because I thought, why can't I be seen as everybody else? Why can't they just bring me on in the show yeah. as a Bob Odenkirk or a David Cross or a Ben Stiller as just like an agent or a, you know a movie yeah, star? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I thought, why do I have to always be used to serve an agenda? So there was a part of me yeah, that yeah. didn't quite appreciate my good fortune. The, the uh, parallel is the there's there's a comic, but then there's the female comic. Yes. You, know, you have to. There's no. There's a comic. Yes. You know, I just want to be a comic. Character. I just want to be an artist. I don't want. And I, it's it's been most. It's been my lifelong struggle, is to be seen just as a human being, as mm -hmm. a funny person, as a gifted person. Yeah. And um, but I, I I had the I guess. What that 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 old saying you know may you be born in. Um, Exciting time, yeah, yeah, yeah. interesting times, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I had that, in a way, the misfortune and the fortune, of being of being um, coming of age mm -hmm. in an extremely turbulent time, p most likely the most turbulent time for gay men, mm -hmm. in yeah, ever, ever, I would say forever, and um, so, I look back on it now, and I completely understand what people what was going on but I did not then yeah and um, and after after um, Larry Sanders I was naive I thought that I would be now seen as just a person and an actor and that I could play anything but even because I thought my work in kids the whole shows that I can play anyone right but society was not ready for that so you played I could, that character so yeah, well and I and I continued that, to be seen only through that lens uh -huh. as like oh we'll we need to do we need to we need a gay character let's get Scott Thompson mm -hmm. well we need this and I was like no why do that doesn't happen to Dave Foley or Bob Odenkirk why don't you just but the world was not ready for that mm -hmm. and uh, so I paid a price for it and I got very very angry um, at it so um, those were those were very those were tough years, mm -hmm. tough years. I was my naivete. I, I really it, I I was basically woken up like going, oh, this is. And I felt in a way like, you know, both sides. I felt that um, conservatives hated me for a different way, one reason. Liberals didn't hate me, but I felt they used me. Right, right. I felt used as a form of human virtue signaling. Because they're trying to... They're trying to show, show that they're so cool. Right. That they're so down. Right. But in a strange way, and I'm not trying, I'm not saying this with bitterness mm -hmm. or anything, but in a way, they kind of played into the same game. Yeah. They used me to show, to showcase their liberal credentials. Mm -hmm. And that made me angry. Yeah. Because I thought, if you were truly woke, <laughs> you just hire me to play because of my talent, right. but you're using me to show off, yeah. and to that was the much of my career. So it's interesting to me, you establish yourself with Kids in the Hall, you establish, establish yourself with Larry Sanders, when, when do you feel you get to call the shots on this issue? Never? Mm. I feel now, maybe, I mean, you know. The world has changed drastically the last five years, yeah. particularly when it comes to like, you know, gay, lesbian, whatever, whatever acronym you want to yeah. use. <laughs> I liked it during the monologues. I, I <laughs> really, I, I'll be honest, I cannot say it. I can't. Yeah, I, I literally over it. <laughs> cannot say it. I cannot say LGBTQ. I can't. I just did it. You just did it. But I can't. Yeah. I. I I don't buy into it, mm. and um, I, 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 when, when a person addresses me as a member of the LGBTQIA community, I shut down. Mm. I literally look at them like, why don't you just call me a bug? <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> like, it's like identity politics. How thin do we want these slices right. to go? Right. When are we gonna just be people? Mm -hmm. When's that going to come? Yeah. When's the true revolution going to come? Yeah. And that's what I'm waiting for. 
that true revolution, when it's like we just get rid of all this nonsense, this identity politics nonsense that I believe is keeping us apart. It started off as a wonderful notion, but I believe it's it's curdled. It's gone too far. Yeah. It, and I just, I, I, it's for me even to say I reject it is, is, I know that will get me in trouble, supposedly, but I just, I, I can't do it. Mm. I just go, I, I'm a gay man. That's what I am. Yeah. And I'm a many, I'm, I'm a Canadian, I'm a gay man, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fading blonde. You know, <laughs> there's many things that I am. You know? Um, but I, I just think it's, uh, Colonel, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. do you believe? Do you agree with me? Because I'm, I'm very curious. Yeah, Sometimes yeah, yeah. this people, and they look at me like, oh, oh, I'm not gonna go there, because no one wants to go there. But I feel in this stage of my life, I think maybe it's age and what I've been through, that yeah. I really don't care anymore. Yeah, and I'm and Buddy is my the weapon right now. He's like my armor, and mm -hmm. I cannot be touched. Yeah. No, I, I feel that age has, uh, this, it's two, two elements. Age allows me to see things from a, not just a black and white, but many shades of gray in between. Absolutely. So I, I, I absolutely hear what you're saying. There's agreement in what you're saying. I, you know, if, but if I talk to somebody that says, no, we absolutely have to have these identity politics and we have to have the But most likely the L, that person is very young. Yes, that is true. That is true. So the young kids listening to this need to realize that as you age, you're get, going to get a different awareness. That is life. Of, that's absolutely that's life. That's yeah. the, and, uh, and if you don't, yeah. you have to question what kind of person you are. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you don't gain an understanding or an empathy mm -hmm. from everybody's point of right. view, I don't think you're really growing. Mm -hmm. And that's the second thing, and it's not just the, I understand the, the spectrum of, of shading to an issue, but it's, I, I can only accept you as a person if I say your truth is your truth. Yes. How you, your opinion is yours. Who am I to tell you that you're wrong mm -hmm. or right? Cause, and with that uh, evolution of, of thinking, today I might say red's my favorite color, tomorrow it's going to be purple. We just don't know. Okay. We, yeah. we really don't know. Like, I mean, that's one of the things about youth. It's about you're certain. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, you're, and yes. You're, you're certain this is the only way. I have an 11 year old. Yeah, yes, it is. I and, know. and it's a revolution. <laughs> and revolutions, lots of people die in revolutions. Yeah. yeah. The only thing I can do now is my own internal revolution. Mm -hmm. I, I can yeah. become a better person, a better comedian, a yeah. better artist. Um, and what you hope, too, is with, with this. Um, life philosophy that you gain and that you're sharing through you know the, the buddy call monologues is that you catch on enough people that are younger yes. who are open enough to think oh okay I could learn from this yes I mean obviously we're gonna laugh I doing see, it but <laughs> like my number one goal as I especially as a comedian as I've grown into this world and my role I, I see it more and more as funny is funny mm -hmm. nothing is off topic it's what the glory of comedy. Yeah. Why I worship it. Yeah. Um, and and, and uh, I don't want a single moment in my shows where it feels preachy. And when I was younger, I think that was one of the things that might have marred some of my work. Mm. There might have been some preachiness, some anger that was undistilled, and. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not proud of it. There's certain things I look back on. Even Buddy Cole Mollum is where, where I go, I went over there too. I went over the line. Mm. I let people see the petticoats. I let them see what was underneath. Huh. And I love saying petticoat because I'm in Texas. <laughs> and I was looking at a, long, a stuffed longhorn. So what am I going to do? I just immediately had a vision petticoat. of a pioneer woman <laughs> lifting her petticoat. Um, so I, I literally, my belief now is I don't want any of that. I just want funny. And the Buddy Cole show is probably, no, it is. It is the funniest show I've ever done. Yeah. I've done many one-person shows. This is the funniest show I've ever done. Yeah. It's There's impressive not a, to watch you, too. For, hmm? It's impressive to watch because I don't, uh, 
I often see comedy showcases, right. stand up, it's 10 minute sets, okay, maybe a 25 minute set, okay, maybe a yeah. 40 minute set, but you 70. are up there 70 minutes. Yeah, at least. And I was trying to figure, I, I'm sure you've done it enough and it is your life. Yes. But I'm like, how does he get through that material without? Well, you know, a lot of it, because Buddy Cole is, he's a character, mm -hmm. but he's my alter ego, mm -hmm. and almost everything you see in that show is there's there's truth to it mm -hmm. no everything yeah. and there they are things that actually happen to me of course they're th I put them in the buddy Cole sieve yeah so they're not exact but there's so it's my life right and also you know I know all the tricks of memorization it's just you learn you make monomic kind uh -huh. of um, uh, links it's like barrel of monkeys you know, yeah. you, I don't know if yeah. you even yeah. know what that yeah. people know yeah, what that absolutely. is anymore. But you just have the one monkey in the hand. It's got to you got to know what that. Why would that monkey grab that other monkey? And there has to be something like you say the word olden, and then that will make me think of a jalopy, and then the jalopy will make me think of oh people traveling around from town to town, and then I'll remember what the next mm. monologue is, the next paragraph uh -huh. is about. So the one thing about all this the, this memorization. Is it, it does make me feel like young because I'm like I can memorize. Oh. I could well, no, I could memorize the Quran. <laughs> but know? would you want to? I wouldn't want to, <laughs> but I could do it. Yeah. You know, like you know, and then sometimes my show goes longer. I'll do an encore. I didn't do it that night because they needed someone out, but I'll do another show, another piece afterwards. And sometimes I'm in the middle of it, going, how do I know all this stuff? But I've been writing this for my whole life. Mm -hmm. Like this show, I've been w working on this show since 1995. And um, so there's, but it's, it's very, very um, it's calculated. The moment, I, I don't let people have much time to think. Mm -hmm. um, they can think about it after. Right. But if I say something appalling, they don't have much time to stew in their mm -hmm. anger yeah. or outrage it's quick because paced, I, yeah. I hit them again. Mm -hmm. And that's the goal. It's like the Buddy Cole book that's just been re-released this year. The goal of that book, Buddy Babylon, was hit them, hit them, hit them, hit them. And that's Buddy's philosophy. Uh -huh. You don't give them a second to think about what you've said right. or to stew in it. Mm -hmm. And we are in a very stewy time. Yes, we are. Everybody mm -hmm. is so thin-skinned. And I'm, Buddy is so thick-skinned. <laughs> and even though like, people say to me, I was, I was alluding to this earlier, that they expect that I'm going to get into trouble. And a lot of people say, how can you say, you must have young social justice warriors attacking you. And frankly, no. And it's not like my shows are all old people. Yeah. There's lots of young people that come to see me. And I can see them looking at me like, he did, this is his second rape joke, and I'm <laughs> laughing? And I can't explain yeah. it. I'm like, well, it's funny. It's like this whole idea that there's certain things that can't be joked about. What do you mean you can't make rape jokes? No, no, That's no, ludicrous. No, okay. What you mean, the worst thing on earth is murder. Nothing, no, inarguably. Mm -hmm. Nothing's worse than murder. Mm -hmm. There's more jokes about murder than adultery, <laughs> right? Comedy's our way to deal with pain. Yeah. And I've seen a lot of pain in my life. Yeah. So I've been very, again, like the philosophers say, I've been cursed with a very turbulent life. I've seen a lot of, I've been at the center of many of the biggest fault wounds in our society. And I think I've allowed it to give me empathy. For there isn't, no one's pain to me is I don't find anybody's pain uh, um, unknowable or I don't even I don't find anybody's pain um, that I, I unrelatable yeah mostly yeah, yeah, yeah. when I, right. I can hear I think about what I've been through mm -hmm. and I I can go I, I, I can relate to that and, yeah. and that's a curse and a blessing yeah it may be unique because only you live in your your body and your brain, but it is not solitary. No, and I'm a very social creature, mm -hmm. and um, you know, there, I've been through a lot, and um, I, I, you know, I've emerged through it. I mean, you're never really, you're always emerging. Yeah. 
uh, I don't I, I, I don't feel um, burdened by it any longer yeah. I feel in many ways blessed by it this is, no. <laughs> is, is very interesting, and, and I want to be respectful of your time. No, that's good. I'm enjoying on. talking oh, to you. Oh, good, good. Uh, you mentioned early on that you had wanted to pursue ballet. And yes, I, that's I, exactly what I wanted. I connected the thread to you talking about it surprises you that social justice warriors don't come after you for the yeah. for the way that you approach uh, Buddy Cole and his, his positions. And uh, my, my connecting thread is because you, you have honed this over your career and your yes. life mm -hmm. that you're able to dance that ballet and construct it in a way that they can't come after you. That's, I mean, they you. can. Yeah, it's actually, in many ways, this is the, mo the most beautiful dance I've ever choreographed. Because and and it he, is beautiful. I, mean, I, I think I it is. I think it, it is a beautiful show. Yeah, yeah. I do. I think it's a beautiful, it's well hilarious and, show. Yeah. And I think Buddy is, 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 a, is, is on fire. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing this right now. I'm, 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 and this sounds weird, but I feel called. I'm called to do uh -huh. this show. I feel that it's my duty. Yeah. And, and I think with particularly young people, when they see me, I think they see a war veteran. Hmm. And they, they, they have to, they have to listen. Yeah. Because I think they can sense that I'm coming at it through love. And I think they have to listen because they see that this character and me underneath is wounded mm -hmm. and has seen action. So they have to hear it. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and I'm not coming at this from a position of I'm not a, I'm not a, a, a you know a computer warrior living behind a screen mm -hmm. behind a, a fake name who has who never leaves their basement. You know, I've seen shit. I've seen, you know, cancer, yeah. And yeah. high school massacre. I've been in, you know what I mean? I was firebombed. I've, I've seen religious extremism. I've seen shit. And, and I, I came out as a gay man in the middle of a war, in the middle of, and so I don't, and also, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a white male. And, and I've watched what's happened to white males, straight white males particularly, mm -hmm. and I've seen this complete reversal. Mm -hmm. And I have this empathy for the underdog, and and that's who I see. Yeah. I see pain, and so I cannot ignore it. I can't ignore anyone's pain. I don't care where it comes from. Yeah. Thirty years ago, when I started, it was a very, very different world. The kids in the hall take on business would not be the same today. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be an attack on straight white men in gray flannel suits. It would be a very different, nuanced world. Yeah. And um, so, I just feel that this this juncture in time is perfect for me and perfect for Buddy mm -hmm. because he just doesn't care. He cares, he cares but, but he doesn't yeah. care what you think. Yeah. Like it's <laughs> like you know, no, he just doesn't care. Um, it's interesting that you have that position, but I think Buddy would go, you're wrong. <laughs> and you'll see, yeah. we're lucky, you know, when you see the arc of history, you understand that it changes and ebbs and flows. And that's what it, what was interesting about the show is the, the you know, the, the snapshots of, in history and seeing the world. Through, yeah, you know, I change around him, but he doesn't years. really change. Yeah, no, no. No, he, he does not change. Yeah. He's a classic comic character mm -hmm. in that they don't really change. Yeah. And he's, he's, uh, he's so unlike me in that he's, he accepted who he was and what he was at a very young age. You know, uh, he, never, mm. he never had that existential crisis that I had. Yeah. He never thought he was garbage. He always thought, I'm the star of my show. I'm the star of my life. I am not a supporting player. I am the star. And that's huge. I was never like that. OK, I don't know if you just caught this, but I almost welled up. Did you? Because <laughs> the, as you were just talking, the notion just hit me that Buddy Cole has been the character that you've been waiting to grow into. Yes, I am him now. 
That is true. How fabulous. Yes, and I, I've always, you know, I think a lot of sketch comics, they play characters that are older than they are, uh-huh. and I'm now the age. I'm, I'm, I'm literally that guy. Yeah. And, and he's, sm- he's stronger, smarter, funnier than me. But, you know, I put that armor on, and you can't touch me. Yeah. You can touch me, but you can't touch, you can't touch me when I'm wearing him. Yeah. No, it's not possible. <laughs> it's not possible. Um, so, anyways. <laughs> yeah. This, this has been an absolutely f- fascinating conversation. Uh, yes, I, I've enjoyed I'm this just, very much. Good, good, good. Uh, I, oh. Can we talk about what you see yeah. next, or do you want to live yes. with the Buddy Co monologues for a while? Well, no, I, I, what I, I want to capture this lightning in a bottle mm-hmm. this year. It has to happen. Yeah. I have some people that are look that really want to produce it, and I'm doing the show. I'm in the middle of a tour. I go to um, back to LA. I do the show at UCB, the final time, which I've been working. That's where I've been working the show out for the last year. Uh-huh. And then I go to Toronto. Then I go to Chicago. And but my goal is um, I want a special. I need this to be a special, and that's it's, and I it's going to happen. Yeah. And there's certain, like there are certain things, the last, particularly the last, I would say the last third of the show, because I became very inspired since I moved back to the States the last year and a half. Those, those last three pieces, I guess, yeah, uh, Anything Goes, New Expectations, and um, Too Far, those pieces need to be heard now. And particularly the last one, the Too Far one. And I need, and no one's saying what I'm saying. And that's an exciting place to be. Yeah. But yes, I need this to be captured soon. And, and I'm going to make that happen. Yeah. And then, but I, I've put my eggs in Buddy's basket right now because he seems to be the right guy for the times. Yeah. And um, it, it, it kind of is, it staggers me at my age that I might have a moment. That it might actually, it might actually work out. Uh-huh. <laughs> and and all my years of fighting it, I, I'm you know, fighting Buddy and fighting being seen that way. I've made peace with it. Yeah. And he is my he's my he is my philosopher king. Mm-hmm. And um, so it just seems like he's the right guy for the job. And I'm not really the right guy for the job. Oh, you are. Stop. Well, I am, but I still have lots of pain that I think manifests. I think I still have anger that people can sense, but not when I'm him. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm him, but um, so that's my goal. And what I would love, I would love, I would love a show. That's what I would love. Yeah. Well, my d- big dream ever since the kids in the hall ended was I would like to create and show run my own show. Yeah. And that's what I want. And that's what I'm set. My, that's my goal. Mm-hmm. And, and to I be think clear, it's time. A TV show. TV, or, absolutely. Or Netflix no, no, I want a TV show. Okay. I want a TV show. Uh-huh. That's what I want. And I, I would love a Buddy Cole TV show, or even if it's a character, multi-character show, or a mm-hmm. talk show. I, I want to be finally at the helm. I want, you know. But I will also say that if the kids in the hall, if we finally got our shit together and we got to be rebooted, I would drop everything. <laughs> I, I make a joke about it. if I was holding a newborn baby, I'd drop it on its head and I would <laughs> do that because and that, that is true. Yeah. Um, and it, because for me, I live in the kids in the hall. Like it's what I've been waiting for. It's what I, I live for is to create characters, create scenarios, dress them, you know, populate them, produce them, put them out there. That's my love. Yeah. And the kids in the hall allows me to do that. So that's my. So those are the two things, my own show, or the kids in the hall show. Or of course I would take oh. a part in a show. I, of course I would love that too. But you know I just feel like I feel like the world's changed enough that I can be seen as a a fully three dimensional person now, mm-hmm. a fully three dimensional comedian, rather than a um, yeah um, rather than a kind of a. I, I won't be used anymore. And I just, I don't, yeah. that sounds ugly, but. Yeah. It makes sense in terms of the conversation well, the we've been having. And, I, and, and, and the world's moved on. Like, I think that people, even on, you know, on my side, go, you know, maybe he's right. Like, we didn't quite see him, though, you know? And I think people need to, liberals particularly, need to look at their own behavior. Mm-hmm. That's why I love yeah. Get Out. It called liberals on their racism. Mm-hmm. And that's. 
because we're all human. Right. right. So, and what I see, in this, and that's why I moved back to this country, because I knew, I mean, I'm a proud Canadian, but Canada cannot do showbiz. God bless it, it just can't. <laughs> It does so many other things so well, but yeah. this country does show business, which I adore. But I have never seen this country in such a state. Yeah. And um, I have to be honest, I find it heartbreaking to see this country ripping itself apart. Yeah. I don't think there's a need for it. And I think the left and the right need to start talking. It's like the brain. You can't have the left side and the right side of the brain not talking to each other. That will destroy you. Mm -hmm. It will destroy you. We are a human being. Is just a country, a nation, you know, a group, a tribe. There are certain things that you that that, that you hold dear. Mm -hmm. that, and I see it fraying. And I see guilt everywhere. And um, so I'm really, I'm a person that tries to walk the middle. Yeah. And people are demonizing the middle. And I don't like that. Yeah, you have to pick your side. That's yes. And so I think of it as like, you know, the, you know, the Red Sea and there's the two, and you've got, there's this, there's this dry path to um, the truth. And while those waves are being held back by God or whatever it is, you must stay the course. <laughs> Not that this is funny, but this is how I see it. You must stay the course because at the end of that, because those waves can come crashing back quickly. And uh, I really fear for the future of this country if people don't start listening to each other and, and seeing this digging in of heels, which I see, not good yeah. it's what it's what when you when countries and societies do that that is the first step towards like civil war and civil and that kind of crumbling and I, I don't know if it can actually be stopped because yeah. you know good, like life doesn't care about us as individuals nature doesn't care about countries it doesn't care about any of those things and it will just keep rolling along you know, but I would hate to see this country rip itself apart. Yeah. Yeah. And I do think you're in that place. So I went a year and a half ago, oh, it's time to go back. And I, it's time to give it one more shot. Mm. Things have changed enough that I think I will actually be given a, a real shot at it. Yeah. A real shot at being part of the conversation because, um, you know, I also think you are a country right now that needs outsiders. You need outside voices in comedy, and I think that's probably why on television, especially in the talk show wars, so many outsiders are flourishing, because yeah. they, they bring something to this country that you need to hear. Right. It's the, the story of diversity. Diversity yes. is a good thing. Which is, I don't think it's any coincidence that you have a, you have a South African, a Brit, a mm. Canadian, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, you, you, yeah. you, you need it. And, um, so I'm going to put a, a plug in. You're going to hate this, but I just can't resist. And uh, I'm a fan, so there's, you know, there's, what are you going to do to me? I'm, I'm also old, too, so I don't really care. So I'm going to put a, a button on, on sure. this and say, so what we need is Buddy Cole 2020. Even though he's Canadian, he, probably, he can't technically be our future president. It's very president, funny you say that because what we used to do in the first iteration of this show, the last monologue, I, call, I said it took place in 2020. As if it was, you know, that was a riff on the election, the coming yeah. election. And also a riff on Buddy Cole being ahead of his time. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, you know I, I, it's, it's a fascinating time right now. And yeah. I seem to flourish in turbulent times. Mm. Oh my gosh, you're bringing it all back. You know, and, that, and, and, and people, I've been alive now long enough that I look at this period and I remember the late 80s and the early 90s when the kids in the hall were on, mm -hmm. on top of the world and it was similar. A very polarizing time, a time when the world was shifting, mm -hmm. like social tectonic plates were shifting, yeah. you know, uh, AIDS was ravaging a generation. 
the Berlin Wall was falling, Tiananmen Square was happening. So many huge things were going on. Yeah. Political correctness had a stranglehold on popular culture that people have forgotten. And um, this time will pass. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing, that's one of the beautiful things about getting older, is you do understand it will pass. Right, It right, will change. Right. You can't really hold on to this kind of outrage too long. Mm -hmm. Something has to give. And so, we're at the state, and I hope that when it gives, um, it's not going to be too ugly. But it might be. <laughs> <laughs> That's my hopeful s statement. <laughs> it might be, you know. But you know, it's it's life. God, look at what my parents lived through, for God's sake, the Second World War and everything. So, you know. Scott, I like to close out our hmm. my interviews by asking one word to describe your future. Bright. Yay! <laughs> right. That's a wonderful contrast. Yes. The password. Yes. Yeah. It is. I, I feel very bright about my future. Uh -huh. So turbulent to bright. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right, well, I'm going to uh, wrap us up. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, that is a wrap on Comedy Wham Presents. Scott I don't think I said one funny Thompson. thing, but. <laughs> no, you did. Uh, in, uh, I mean, even if you didn't, even if you read a recipe for <laughs> chocolate chip cookies, people would love you. So uh, <laughs> tell us where we can find you either on social media or. Oh, well, you can find, you know, I'm, I'm Scott Thompson underscore on okay. Twitter. And I have a Buddy Cole account, which is, I need to start working better on. Mm -hmm. Buddy Cole's on Twitter mm -hmm. and he's on Instagram. On Twitter, he's Mr. Buddy Cole. Okay. Um, Mr. Buddy Cole, all okay. lowercase, and he has an Instagram account which I've let go, let f go fallow, but I'm going to pick it up again once I get off the road. Um, but I can be found um, back. At, I'm doing UCB uh, in LA, the 28th next Friday. Okay. Then I'll be doing um, the Onion Festival in Chicago, ah. uh, six nights um, at the end of uh, of May, okay. and I'll be doing the Buddy Cole Show in Toronto on May 25th at the Royal Theater. And then my goal, if things go well, I will be taping this special this summer. Yay! That's my oh, that's my goal. Yeah. Because it's it needs to be captured. It's lightning in a bottle right now, and yeah. um, you know, yeah, that's it. Well, if you're as determined as you were to uh, throw the donut at uh, yeah, your, throw your your uh, troop that changed your life, then it will be so. Yeah, I think it will. <laughs> We hope you've enjoyed learning about how Scott got to be the comedic genius and icon that you heard today just as much as I have. Be sure to visit ComedyWham.com, give us a follow on Twitter and Instagram at ComedyWham, and like our Facebook page. You can listen to past interviews on iTunes and your favorite podcast player, and review us while you're at it. Uh, I want to say this again has been... I can't believe I get to say it again. Scott Thompson with Comedy Wham Presents. Thank you, Scott. Thank I'm you very Valerie, much. And that's been funny. Thank you, Valerie. <laughs>